Hey everybody, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Addicted to Gear. My name is Tony. Today we're going to be looking at the Hotone Ampero multi-effects unit, but we're not actually going to be talking about the effects unit per se. We're going to be talking about the software editor that is bundled and comes with this unit when you purchase it, because that is where you can squeeze every last drop of goodness uh, and awesome tones out of the Ampero and I thought it would be well worth the effort to talk about that and go through it with you in detail so you could understand the interface a little bit better and you're more familiar with it as a whole so that you can start creating your own unique tones with this unit. Now full disclaimer the video will be a little bit long it might be dry for some of you that are not interested in the editor, but I think it's essential to understand how to use it if you wanna take the baby steps and learn how to go forward and really build great tones. So without further ado, let's get started and take a look at the editor. All right, so we're gonna start off this video lesson on the Ampero Editor version 1.2.7 so that at the end of the video, you all should be more familiar with the editor and understand exactly how it works and where you can find all the different options that you will need to be able to build your sounds and create something very good sounding at the end of it all, okay? So let's start off by looking at the window and the first thing that I want to describe to you is how you actually get the window on your screen. A lot of people end up skipping this step, but it's very important. The first thing you want to do is you want to download the Ampero Editor software and install it on your computer, whether you have a Mac or, or a PC, it's the same process. So you install that software first, then once you have it installed, you want to physically plug in the Ampero using the USB connector to the Ampero into your computer system, turn on the Ampero, then launch the software. Once the software recognizes that the Ampero is connected to your computer, then the editor screen will turn on and you should see something very similar to what we're showing you on the screen right now. That being said, you want to make sure to look at the top of the screen here and you want to make sure that you are running Ampero Editor version 1.2.7. If you're running anything other than that, you will quickly get confused because the information won't make sense to you if the editor version that you're running is not the same as what we have here. So please ensure that you're running the same firmware. Now, let's start off by looking at where the meat and potatoes of this editor lie, and that's at the left-hand side of the screen. You'll see here that you have a long list of titles, and they will run from number one all the way down to number 99 at the very bottom here. Okay, These are the list of patches that are installed in the Ampero. Now, you have to understand that there's two uh, series of patches that are installed. One is user patch, the other is factory patches. They're not the same. Although when the Ampero first initially ships out and you receive it, you'll see that both the factory patches and the user patches are identical. Your list will be the same because Ampero basically makes a copy of the factory patches and puts it into the user patch section. Okay, but there is a difference between those two lists and I'll explain to you what they are. So the first thing is that the factory patches that come installed in your Ampero are not editable. That means that you cannot delete them. They're hardwired into your unit. They're basically on a chip and you cannot delete them. Okay, so those spaces cannot be used to create new patches. You can simply use the ones that are there and use them as is. Now, if you want to create new patches, you want to make sure that you're under user patches. These patches that you have here can be edited, can be deleted, modified, resaved, renamed, so on and so forth. 
So that is the difference between these two sections here. So how do you know when you're in a user patch or a factory patch? Well, if we look at the name of the patches, you'll see that the way they're uh, named will basically discern which type of patch they are. Here we can see that we have 01 and it's F for factory 01, which stands for bank one and then dash one, welcome to Ampero. So this patch is the first patch in bank one. And then in bank one, we have bank uh, effect one, two, and three. And then it switches to bank two, effect one, two, and three, bank three, one, two, and three, and so on. So every patch uh, is grouped into a set of three, which basically creates a bank. And you can see that also by looking at the color of the background here, you'll see that it goes from dark to light, dark to light, etc. So that basically shows you that everything is grouped into sets of three. Why do they do that? Well, because the Ampero has three main physical buttons and a fourth button that acts as a control switch. So each one of those buttons can control a specific effect in that bank, okay? So that is why they're grouped that way. Now, there are a lot of effects. So once you fill up your user patches, you basically have about 200 uh, user patches at your disposal. If you want to look for something, it's kind of complicated if you want to try and find something, but Ampero has thoughtfully included a little search bar here, and we can actually type in a search term. In this case, we'll type in the word blue, and we can see that under our factory patches, there are three patches that have the word blue in it, and it could, it could be blue or blues, but as long as it has the word blue in it, it'll pop up. Now you'll see that under user patches, if we do the same thing and type in the word blue, we only have two patches with the word blue in it. If we type in police, I only have one patch with the word police in it. Under my factory patches, however, if I type in the word police, whoop, if I can spell that right, we have no patches. So this is not a global search. In other words, it will not search both the factory patches and the user patches at the same time. It will only search the category you are currently in. You need to keep that in mind. If you wanna go back to the entire list, just delete the word police, hit enter, and you'll have all of your patches come up once again. All right? so. We're gonna start off by looking at the user patches because those are the patches that we can actually edit. So here you'll see a list of my patches and the way I like to create new sounds is by starting off with the factory patches and then going from there. It saves me a lot of time and effort if I basically start off with a patch that is in the ballpark and then eventually tweak it so I can make it specifically what I want. Now, for the sake of this video, I indicated a couple of patches here that I wasn't crazy about and I decided to put a little asterisk next to them so that I could identify them as the ones that I don't mind overriding or editing, okay? So here I've selected a patch. It's uh, basically patch number or bank number 19, patch number three within that bank. And when I select it, you'll see at the top here, this little window will change and the name of the patch that I selected here will appear there. So if I go to Day Tripper, for example, then that'll change. And that indicates that I'm now working within that patch uh, editing features, okay? So the editing features that I've selected will apply to Dyer Brothers number two. Great, so now that we know how that works, let's go in and talk about the actual signal chain. The way the Ampero works is that the signal chain with the effects and the bank all show up here. Each one of these blocks is a different effect 
and it, the effects could be either a digital effect like a, a digital delay, a reverb, an amp simulation, a cabinet simulation, uh, you can have an EQ here and you can have a series of different types of pedals. What's important to understand is that the signal chain goes from left to right and we can see that with the little arrows here. So if, the, if this was your pedal board, basically your guitar would go into effects number one right over here and then move its way across the effects chain towards the, the right hand side until it actually gets out of the speaker. All right. So it's important to understand the flow of things because that's going to determine how your effects are built. Now, each one of these blocks um, is an integrated part of your sound. Every one of these blocks can be changed, can be turned on or off, and you can select what effect you want to put into whichever particular block, okay? The important thing to remember is that there is a limit of nine physical blocks. Each one of these blocks, we can see here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. So we have nine physical effects blocks that we can put some sort of, of an effect in, and we're limited to nine. We can't go beyond nine, and we cannot actually delete them. We could only turn them off. That's the way the system was hardwired, and it's a question of physical memory. We cannot go beyond nine blocks of effects. So that's important to note. However, we can turn effects on or off. How do we know if an effect is on? Well, basically at the top of the block, we have the name, and then we have the little circle with a little colored button in it. If the effect is on, the button is actually activated. If we click on the button, we could turn it off or gray it out. That means that if the effects are off, they do not sound. So you won't hear the EQ or the amp or the noise reduction or the cabinet or the delay or the reverb, okay? So of course, if we have everything turned off, then we have no sound, so we don't want that. But if we want specific uh, sounds to come through, this is how we select them or turn them on or off. So of course, we're always gonna wanna have an amplifier in, in the chain. We're always want, are gonna have a cabinet in the chain. And when we go into the individual banks, we can select what type of amplifier we wanna use. So if I click on this box, you'll see that the indication at the bottom of the page will change. And then we have our effects list here. And this is a list of all of the amplifiers we can choose from within the Ampero and the list is quite extensive as you can see over here, okay? So we have a lot of effects uh, we can choose from and one of the effects is actually an amp simulation. So for example, in this particular case, we have something that represents a, a, a Vox, which is a 30 uh, watt Vox. And if you're not familiar with, with what the actual cabinets or amplifiers will do, you just need to select one of them and there's a little description here that basically tells you what it is or what type of amplifier it is if you're not familiar with it. So for example, let's say I wanna go with something that everyone's familiar with. We'll go with a Marshall, uh, maybe a 45. So this is a 45 Plexi style amplifier and you can see here now the name changes to Marshall 45 and we have a series of uh, knobs here that represent the knobs on the front of the amplifier. So different amplifiers will have different knob com combinations. Same holds true for the effects. They're all different, so some of them will have more uh, controls than others. So the Marshall 45 typically has the volume, presence, output, bass, middle, and treble. So the volume is the overall volume of the amplifier. So we want to set that to where we think it, it sounds right. And then we can tweak the presence and output and bass and everything else associated with that particular amplifier. Once we have that set up the way we want, we normally would go and select a cabinet. So if I click on the cabinet block here, 
the information on the left hand side of the screen will also change and now you'll see all of the different cabinets that we have that we can choose from so in this particular case i think a good match for the marshall would be the uk green 4x12 cabinet which is basically an emulation of a marshall type cabinet with green back speakers in it so once we select the cabinet you'll see that in this particular case instead of knobs per se we have a representation of the speaker and this little crosshair and circle represents where the microphone is being pointed at. So in this case, we have a ribbon, 121 ribbon microphone selected. And I usually like those microphones, so I usually stick with them. And then we can take the little circle here and select where we want to have it pointing at the speaker cone. And this will change the sound the more it's pointed to the center of the speaker, the brighter it will get. And then as it goes further away from the center of the speaker, it'll dull out the sound. And you can see that when I move the crosshairs, it also changes the X and Y position. So the X is how far up or down it is on the grid. But we also have the option of the Z. The Z is basically how far from the grill we want to have the speaker. So the further away it is, then that will change the sound. And we can do that by just typing in a number between one and a hundred, for example. And if we want to maybe just leave it at 50, we can do that as well. You can see the circle becomes larger or smaller depending on how close or how far the actual microphone is put into the speaker. Once we have that set up the way we want it to be, we also have the option of adjusting the volume of the microphone and that will also affect the overall volume of our effects. And one thing I want to say about the Ampero is that there's probably four or five or maybe well, at least five different places that you can affect the overall sound of the uh, the effects that you save. So you have to keep that in mind. We'll talk about that in a little bit more detail as we go through the rest of the, uh, the lesson here. But just suffice it to say that you have to keep that in mind, okay? Now, once we select the speaker cabinet, we also have the ability to import uh, impulse response files and those files are basically emulations of certain cabinet and speaker combinations that we can actually import so if we want to import any kind of IRs you can see them here at the bottom of my list these are my own personal IRs that I have imported here we can only import 10 of them but if you want to go with a specific cabinet type and speaker type and you have the IR you can simply click on import IR file right over here. It'll open up a dialog box and here you can select what position you want to have the IR inserted when once you import it. And then you would go in and select the file where you have the IR and it's as simple as that to import them. And using IR, IRs goes a long way into getting a specific sound that you want, okay? Once you have selected an IR, you have to once again go in and select the cab, uh, the type of microphone you want to use and reset where you want it to be and so on and so forth, okay? But it's pretty simple to do. So once we have our basic amplifier and our basic cabinet set up, the rest is sort of like seasoning on the cake. At this point, we could customize the sounds. We can go in and for and for all intents and purposes, select an EQ pedal, for example, and be able to tweak the sound even further. Say we wanted to give it a little bit of a spike there, we can do that as well. If we wanna give it a little boost, we can do that as well. And then we turn it on to make sure that it's engaged so that once we have the effect saved, that uh, actual pedal comes through in the mix, okay? so. There are certain aspects of certain effects that you will see are not um, available on other effects. Let me explain that to you. For example, if we go into the enhancer pedal here, which we want to turn on, the enhancer is basically a copy or a virtual representation of the EP booster. 
And here we can see that we have a couple of switches that represent the 3D boost that is available on the pedal. We also have a bright switch. So if we want that pedal to be a little bit brighter than normal, we can engage that. And then we have the volume. All right. So let's say we want it to be the way it is now and we want to make sure it's turned on. So we turn that on in the, in the settings up here. You'll notice that when we go to the delay settings, for example, we have additional sliders that don't appear on other pedals. And I'll explain to you what they do. In this case, we have the recaller pedal and we have our mix knob, our feedback knob and our time knob, which is normal for a, del for a delay pedal. But we also have two sliders here. So one of the sliders is the sync slider and the other is the trail slider. So I want to basically make you understand what the difference is here. The sync slider allows us to synchronize the repeats of the delay with the patch tempo. Now you're going to say, well, what's a patch tempo? Well, I'm glad you asked. A patch tempo is the ability to actually set a beats per minute tempo to this particular patch. And we do that right up over here where you'll see the little metronome. And right now it's currently set to 80 beats per minute. Let's say we wanted to set this at 120 beats per minute. So now whenever this patch is engaged and the sync slider is turned on for my delay pedal, the delay will synchronize to 120 beats per minute. So if I know I'm using this particular patch for a song that I'm going to be playing that is supposed to be at about 120 beats per minute, it's already going to be synced up. Now, of course, you can still synchronize the, the tempo with the foot switch because you do have the ability to have the tap tempo engaged where you can select how quickly you want to have the delay pedal uh, have the repeats happen. But it, this is an easy way of doing it if you know that it's not going to change. Now, the other slider here to the right is the trail slider. The trail slider basically represents the cutoff of the sound. So when you're using effects like delays or reverbs, reverbs in particular have a trail to them. They don't just cut off. They, they basically fade until it, it stops. So you want to make sure if you if you're switching patches and you have your reverb engaged, you don't want it to cut off abruptly. So what you want to do is you want to engage the trail option so that when you're switching between patches, you don't have that abrupt cut in the reverb. That's very important to get a natural sound. So I tend to leave trail on for both my delays and my reverbs, just so that I make sure I don't have that rough cut. So you have to keep that in mind. Now that trail and um, the, uh, the sync option is not available in other effects like the distortion or the overdrive effects. They typically don't apply, all right? So let's say we have the sound the way we want it to be now, but I wanna change something. I wanna put um, maybe I want to put my EQ after my amplifier. How do I do that? Well, there's an easy way to change the signal chain of your effects, and that's right over here. So you would click on manage your signal chain. And here now you have a list of all your blocks. And so all you need to do is grab the block you want to move and just put it where you want it to be and let go and then click OK. And like magic, now you can see that the EQ pedal is after the amplifier. Now, I'm not saying that's the best place for it, but I'm just trying to show you that you do have the ability to move the blocks around, all right? Great. Now, the other thing I wanted to say is that you'll see that you can turn off the effects, as we mentioned earlier, you can turn them on or off, but let's say, you like the way this effects chain is right now, okay? So I'm gonna just make sure that my switch, my control switch is off, and I'm gonna say, when I, when I turn this effect on, I wanna have my wall pedal on, 
I want to have my mini vibe pedal on, the Marshall amplifier going into the EQ. I'm going to turn off the noise gate. My cabinet is going to be activated and I don't have any delay or reverb. Okay. Now, when I go into the solo, I like to have my enhancer pedal on and maybe my recaller, which is the, the delay pedal and the reverb pedal go on. So how can I do that? Well, the first thing I would do is save this snapshot. So I would just click save and make sure that it's saved to the same location. So I'm going to do that. Great. Now I'm going to go into the little button that says control expression. And I'm going to go to the second setting right over here. And you can see that there are certain things that are on. And these represent an on off switch that I can use with my effects. So for example, if I know I want to turn on effects one during the solo, and I want to turn on my delay and reverb during the solo, I can just select them, close my window. Now, when I hit the control switch on my device, those effects, so the number one, the delay and the reverb should actually go on. So let me hit that. And as you can see, now they're on. All right. And I did that by hitting the control switch or switch number four on the physical Ampero. If I click that again, they'll go off. So basically I made two versions of the same effect. And this way you can actually have different scenarios happening depending on what you need in your life situation. And it's very easy to do. All right. So that is a cool aspect of how you can use some of the effects and build up some of your patches for when you're playing in a live situation. Now you can also rename the patch and you can do that by clicking the rename button up here. Just right click that and basically come here and say, I just want to call this Dire Brothers and save it. Now that you'll see will update right over here. You can also go into the left hand window here, right click it with your mouse. And here you have options to import, export, rename, copy or paste. So the rename option would work the same way as I just showed you. The copy and paste option will allow you to copy this patch. So let's try this. I'm going to copy the patch and I'm going to paste it over Strat Dog over here by right clicking and hitting paste. So there you go. So now you see I, I took the Dyer Brothers that I had in number 19 here and I copied it into number 20. All right. So one thing I want to say about the Ampero that is important to understand, there's no way for us to quickly just grab a block here and drag it into another location. It doesn't work. There is no option for that. So if you want to change the organization of your patches, you have a couple of options. Either you leave a couple of blank patch uh, locations available where you can copy uh, them over or you would export all of your patches individually like I showed you earlier and then re-import them in the correct order. It's a little bit of a hassle I know and this is something that people have been asking the people at Hotone to implement for a long time but unfortunately they haven't done it yet but that would be a great thing for them to actually improve upon in my opinion. So hopefully we'll see that being implemented soon. Now, one of the other aspects of your patch that is important is the patch volume. And here we can see at the bottom of the top of the screen here, we do have a patch volume set at 65. This slider goes from zero to 99. I usually like to keep my patches at about, about halfway. It's never a good idea to have a patch that's too hot because then you're going to get distortion and you're going to get some weird things happening in terms of your sound. So I like to keep the sound under control, but you have to keep in mind there's a few different places for the volume uh, to be activated within a patch. This is one of them. You can actually get your sounds 
louder by playing with the output here and the gain in your amplifier. You can also get the sounds louder or more quiet by going into the volume of the microphone right over here. There's also a physical button on the front of the Ampero which is a volume knob, so you could actually increase the volume there. And there's also another place to increase the overall volume, which I'll explain to you in just a couple of seconds. So having the proper balance within your effects in terms of the sounds is super important. And what you wanna do is when you create an effect, you wanna make sure that when you're switching between one effect and the other, that you don't have a huge jump in volume or things don't become too quiet. You want to have all of your effects at more or less the same volume so it doesn't get hard to manage in a live situation when you're switching between patch to patch. So let's look at the top of the page right now because there's a couple of things that we haven't addressed yet. At the top here we do have the ability to actually use drum simulations within our patches and within the looper. Now, if you're looking to play along with a metronome, for example, you know how boring it could become. And it's a lot more interesting to actually use drums. So here you can actually go into this setting here and use the drums as uh, a metronome or as part of your looper. So let's say we want to go into a rock beat. Just to make things interesting, we want to select rock ballad. So that will be the type of style of drums we will have. Underneath that, we can select the volume of how loud we want the drums to be. And then we can select the drum tempo. The drum tempo is basically how fast or slow we want the drums to play. So let's say we go to 100 beats per minute. One thing to understand is that the drum tempo has nothing to do with the patch tempo, okay? You can actually have independent time signatures and they're not, if I change one of these, it's not gonna automatically change the other. If you're intending on playing the patch with your looper and you want the repeats of your delay to match, then you would wanna make sure that your patch tempo within your effects matches your drums, okay? But you don't have to do it that way. So once you've selected the tempo, you've selected the style of drums and the volume, then you would click the play button. In this particular case, I can't make you hear it because it won't come through, but it will basically play what you've selected and you'd be able to then go into the looper and play this particular type of drums along with the patch that you've selected. So this comes in very handy when you're trying to practice. Now the next step is to go into the little gear icon on the left here, click that and it brings up the settings page which is quite important and it's very important for us to go through that. So I'm gonna start off by talking about the general settings. The general settings allows you to tweak the Ampero and make sure that you can use it um, as a DAW, for example, and you get all of the levels the way you want them to be. So the first option here is the ins and outs level. So I normally put this quite low. You'll see here that I'm at negative 14 decibels. A lot of people think that it's best to keep it at zero, but it also depends on how dynamic the pickups that you're using. If you're using active pickups, they can be a lot louder. In my particular case, I feel I get the best dynamics by taking this down and bringing it all the way to minus 14 decibels. So you can experiment with this in terms of what gives you the best results with a more natural feeling sound. Underneath that we have the unbalanced output modes and these two sections basically will allow you to have the unbalanced outputs on the back of the Ampero either designated for an instrument or a line out. Now I usually use this with my guitar only so I usually select the unbalanced output as an instrument. Uh, if you're going to a, a recording device or you're going to a mixer, you might want to choose line. I usually leave the balanced output mode uh, as line because normally when I'm using balanced outputs, I'm usually going out to something else to record. Next, we have the no cabinet mode, left and right. So the Ampero basically allows you to emulate a cabinet when you're using it. And it's very important to know that you can turn this on or off. So if you're using the Ampero 
uh, simply as an effects unit and you don't want it to emulate a cabinet, then you could turn off cabinet emulation right over here. The way it's actually worded, however, is a little bit misleading and you have to understand how it is uh, set up so that you don't get mixed up. And I'll explain it to you right now. So if you want the cabinet mode to be turned off, then you have to understand that no cabinet off means that it's on, okay? And no cabinet on means that it's off. I have both of these set up to no cabinet off, which means the cabinet is on. It's basically a double negative, right? So two negatives make a positive. You have to keep that in mind. I don't know why they did that. I think it just got lost in translation and I hope they would fix that because it's a little bit confusing. So basically right now, the way I'm using the Ampero like this means that I'm simulating cabinets because I'm not going into a guitar cabinet with it. I'm going into an FR, FR speaker. I need it to emulate a cabinet. Now, if I was going into my guitar cabinet, on the other hand, I would turn cabinet emulation off because there's no point in emulating a cabinet twice, right? So I hope you understand that. Next, we're gonna go into USB audio. And here is what you would be tweaking if you were using the Ampero as a recording device, because you can actually go into the Ampero and then go straight into your recording software and use the Ampero as a DAW. Now that's the beauty of this device. You can actually use it to go straight into Logic or GarageBand or uh, whatever software you might be using right now. Then you can also select the option of having the signal go in dry without any effects or to emulate the effects off the Ampero. So in my particular case, I like to leave the effects on because I like to have the reverbs and the lays and overdrives and everything active when I'm doing any recordings. But you can also choose to go in dry and then you can put the effects in your software if that's how you prefer to do things. You can also switch and have one dry and the other one wet. So you can have different kind of effects or maybe play around with the way you're making your recordings. So after that, you wanna select the record level. The record level allows you to make sure that your signal is not too hot when you're going into your software or not too low. So you can actually switch it here and you can go from 20 dB boost all the way to negative 20. I usually like to leave it at about negative three just to be on the safe side and make sure that things are not clipping. The monitor level is what you're hearing through your headphones. So if you're using your headphones to listen to the recording while you're making it, you can adjust the level here. Now we're getting to the interesting aspects of these general settings. And this is where we have the ability to control what the foot switches are doing. So we have three uh, typical foot switches with one control switch, but those switches can be designated to do different things. And that's where there's a lot of power and flexibility within this particular unit. And that's why I like it so much. So let me explain this to you. Here we can basically see that we have the option relating to foot switch one, two, three, and four. In this particular case, I'm using foot switch one to go up a patch. When I say up a patch, I mean when I click it, it'll, it'll engage patch one. Foot switch number two will engage patch two. Foot switch number three will engage patch three, and so on and so forth. Number four will uh, act as a control or a tap tempo right now. Now I can also hold foot switch number one down, in which case it will patch down. It will scroll down all the patches till I let go. And the same thing, it will go up a patch if I hold down foot switch number two and scroll up all the patches till I let go. Number three switch, if I hold, if I press down and hold it, will engage the tuner. And number four, if I hold it, will engage the tap tempo. But it doesn't end there because we also have the ability to engage different options with combo switches. Combo switches means where I'm actually hitting both switch one and two at the same time. Now, if I do that, I'm basically banking down so I'm going down an entire bank. And if I hit switch two and three at the same time, I'm banking up an entire bank. 
And if I hit three and four together, it act activates the looper function. All right. So there's a lot of different ways you can engage your, your effects here. Just keep that in mind. Now, if that wasn't enough, you can also plug in an external foot switch in the expression port two at the back of the unit. And you have an additional couple of switches there that you can select how you want to use. I usually use a dual foot switch, but you can actually plug in a single foot switch there or an expression pedal, whatever you like. I usually use a dual foot switch and I usually will select the, the additional buttons on the foot switch to bank up or down because sometimes I like to use my Ampero in a live situation and I usually have a longer lead going to a foot switch so I can actually switch from different places on the stage and I don't have to run back and forth to the Ampero to be able to switch bank. That's just how I like to use them, all right? But you can select the foot switches and make them do different things. For example, you could turn the drums on and off, you can stop the looper, you can engage the drums, you can basically set the looper to record or play. There's many things you can do, but it's very flexible. Finally, on this page, we have the language. So here, basically, we want everything to display in English. The other option would be Chinese, which I don't know how to read, so I'm leaving it as English. The next section on the right hand side here is the MIDI. So if anyone out there has a MIDI controller that you want to use with the Ampero, you can definitely do that. I don't usually use a MIDI device and I'm not going to go through the trouble of explaining how to map your device. Suffice it to say that you can do it and it's all indicated in the manual if you have any questions about that. The about section basically just talks about Hotone, but the thing that's important to note here is that if you have any feedback or if you've experienced any issues or bugs, you can email them at service at hotoneaudio.com and you can leave them your comments and they're very responsive. That's one of the things I really like about the people at Hotone. They're really, they, do, they really do care about their products and they've already released three firmware updates in a very short period of time. They were scheduled to release a fourth update, but it got delayed because of what's happening with the virus. But hopefully after this period is over, they will release that and there will be further improvements. Now, the next button over here is the update firmware instructions, and this basically walks you through the combo switches you need to press to be able to engage a firmware update on the Ampero. So if you wanna load a firmware file, once you have that file, you do the combo switches, follow the instructions right here, and you're able to install it very easily within the device. The help button here is a link to the English manual and the Chinese manual. And the release notes is basically a description of what was fixed with the previous releases. And you can read through all of that over here, all right? So there's a lot of updates that have been done already and there's gonna be a few more, I think, before we're done. I'm really confident that the Ampero is gonna be supported for a while and is gonna be made even better once the new firmware updates are released and I can't wait for that to happen. So that basically in a nutshell is all you need to know about the different sections of the Ampero editor. As you can see, there's a whole lot of information and a whole lot of stuff that you can play around with. It is a little bit of a rabbit hole once you start playing with these types of multi-effects units because there's so much that you can do and so much time you could spend to tweak your, your sounds and get them just right. But I'm telling you, I've spent quite a bit of time already and I'm really digging the sounds that I'm getting out of this unit way more than any of the other effects units that I've had in the past. So I'm super happy with it so far. So guys, I hope that overview helped you get a little bit more familiar with the Ampero editor so that you could be more accustomed to knowing where everything is and where everything is located so that you have an easier time to really hone in on the exact properties that you need to tweak to get those great tones out of the unit. I'm super happy 
that I purchased the Ampero. I think it's a great device so far. I'm loving it. It's doing everything that I need. And I'm going to be putting more videos on how to build your own sounds using the, ed the editor and the Ampero. So stay tuned for those videos, which will be coming up shortly. If you like the content that we're producing here and putting out on a regular basis, please consider subscribing to Addicted to Gear. And if you haven't already hit the little bell icon, please hit the bell icon so that you'll be notified whenever I post a new video and you won't miss any of the great content. So that's it for now, guys. Please stay tuned and keep rocking. There'll be more great videos coming your way right here on Addicted to Gear.